So I was a cop for a couple years. I was a bad cop, not because I was dirty, just because I was moderately incompetent. I remember I arrested this kid, and I'm trying to turn the report into my sergeant. And he's like, did you take pictures? I was like, no. Oh, he's a minor. Did you notify the parents? Like, no. I said, all right, I've, I've made a huge mistake here. I was like, I really not done anything correctly here. I can't just take people to jail. At that same time, I grinded through two years trying to become a professional fighter slash part-time bouncer. <laughs> my fighting career was going OK. I got a call from a buddy who had managed me, and he said, hey, there's a show, The Ultimate Fighter. The UFC is doing it. They want to talk to you. <laughs> I talked to the people at work, and you have to work for a year before you're eligible for rehire. I'd worked for 11 months and 12 days. So basically, if I left, they couldn't rehire me. I get to the airport in Atlanta, and you know, I just had a moment of panic, I guess. And uh, I called my lieutenant back and I said, hey, is there any way we could just forget that I've resigned and you could maybe just throw me back in? I can be back at work Monday. He's like, yeah, yeah, hold on, let me see what I can do. I said, well, don't do it yet. Let me call them and, and see what they have to say. And so I called the producer I'd been in touch with. And basically, what ended up happening is it was like, hold on, I'm gonna get Dana White on the phone. And I was like, oh, oh boy. At the time, we, we were looking for credible guys that we believed could hopefully be world champion someday. Those were the guys, type of people that we were looking for. We didn't have a great connection. <laughs> so I'm like, try to walk around the airport, like get a better connection, to like hear what Dana White's saying, and I'm just kind of like missing every other word. So listen, Forrest, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. This is the chance for you to actually make that dream become a reality. And I'm just like, oh shit, oh shit. Very few people have the opportunity to be a professional athlete, to be special, to do incredible things in front of millions of people and things that inspire other people. This group of guys that we were bringing out for the first season of The Ultimate Fighter were people that we believed had the talent to be these unique, special individuals in life to achieve these great things. I started thinking, man, I'm gonna be some, you know, fat cop in Georgia, driving around, arresting drunk drivers, telling the young guys, oh, I could have done that, oh, I could have I been a UFC fighter, and they'd be like, whatever, man, shut up. You're fat, man. shut up, leave me alone. I'm not that drunk, I don't believe you. hard times and we were losing millions of dollars, but you could feel this thing going like this. You could feel it building. But the question wasn't, can this thing work? It's just, how long till we run out of money before the Fertitas say, forget it, I can't keep funding this thing. Sometimes in business, when things aren't going your way and it just feels like everywhere you move, people are either saying no, or you just can't seem to get that traction no matter how hard you work, how creative you try to be. Days get long and you get a little bit tired. We got to the point where the brothers were tired of writing checks. I knew we were close to closing this thing down and, and it was gonna be a wrap. You know, Lorenzo had called me one day and said, I, I don't know if I can keep fun in this thing with, with my family's money. Me and my brother are, you know, pouring, you know, millions and millions of dollars into this, tens of millions of dollars into this thing. Let me just sleep on it and see how it feels in the morning. And, you know, for whatever reason, sometimes no matter what you feel like the night before, you get a night's sleep and you wake up and you're like, well, let's go get it. And uh, I called up Dan, I said, fuck it, man. Let's just keep rolling. I'm not, I'm not willing to tap out. We needed to get on free TV. Now, when I was a kid, I was a huge boxing fan. And they used to have all the big fights on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Everybody would watch the fights, it was huge. And those fights would build bigger fights. We knew we needed to get on television. Reality shows were huge. And 
We basically used the reality show as our Trojan horse to get this thing on television. A bunch of my staff went into my office at like 11 at night and came out at 2, 2.30 in the morning with the Ultimate Fighter. We went out and we found guys and whittled it down to the 16. One of my first memories as a child was actually sitting with a big old cast on my leg. I remember dragging the leg around like the Terminator for a couple days afterwards. My older brother, keep in mind, is responsible for that broken leg. Well, geez, what am I gonna do? Looks like I'm gonna have to kick his ass, become a big bad ninja. And that really became my purpose in life. <laughs> Well, honestly, my whole life, I was obsessed with being tough. Obsessed with the word tough. Telling people, one day you're gonna look up tough in the dictionary and there'll be my picture. I would say that to people. Like, far out, man. I always pride myself being the toughest student in the grade. But when your older brother's the toughest guy in the school, you're still getting your ass kicked at home. So here I am in college now, and now he's let himself go and I keep working out and growing and getting stronger and training. And now I come home from college. This is back in the days where phones had cords that hung on the wall, right? I'm talking to my girlfriend, phone cords stretched on my bed. He comes home drunk and trying to grab the phone. Like, look, Brian, get out, man. Leave me alone, fuck off, right? Shut the door, I'm back on my bed. I see shards of wood and the fist come flying. There's not even a lock on it. And it's my brother's fist. And he's just in a fit of rage. And I get off the bed and duck a right hand. I get him in a double leg, take him down right to a full mount. Here I am, 20 years old. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ass whoopings he gave me. And I just beat the shit out of him, pounding him. And I think he's out, he's done. And I'm looking at him, and it's like out of a horror movie. All of a sudden, I see, boom, his eyes go like that, his hand reach out. And he caught one of my testicles and absolutely crushed it, crushed it. I let out a blood curl and scream. The only thing I could do to break the grip was stomp him. I got in my car, went back to Purdue, and my testicle was sore for like two weeks, man. But I did kick his ass. I graduate, eventually moved up to Chicago. I go to jujitsu, and the guys there are talking about this reality show that the UFC's having. So I go home, and lo and behold, they wanted audition tapes on a Friday. I just put my fights on a VHS tape, and I only had like six or so at the time. I sent that in along with just a generic thing like this, saying, hi, I'm Stefan Bonner, and you know, I like to fight, and it's fun. <laughs> Chicago riding a bike, and I get the call. We want you on the Ultimate Fighter. I'm like, wow, man, I better uh, get ready for this, man. I'm all hairy, I better go get waxed. And here I am on The Ultimate Fighter 2004, and we're filming. And on the back of those producer chairs, what does it say? T-U-F, T-U-F, T-U-F. And I'm sitting there looking at it, and I'm like, holy shit. When I first heard about The Ultimate Fighter, I was very intrigued. We said, this is brilliant. We're the smartest motherfuckers on the planet. This is gonna be great. We go pitch it. Nobody wanted to do it. They were too scared to take the chance. We had pitched it to Spike. You know, I remember the pitch because the executive, he wanted to go to the Dodger game. We're pitching our hearts out. And all he could think about is the first pitch of the fucking Dodger game. He's standing up wanting to get out, you know? He said, well, yeah, if you guys can pay for it, we'll do a deal. OK. We had someone who would put it on TV. And you know, that's when Lorenzo and Frank had to figure out if they wanted to invest in their sport a little more than they already had. Taking that last $10 million in risk, I felt so strongly about the product. I just felt like that if we got the UFC on TV, it would work. So the Fertitas were willing to invest the last dollars into the UFC with the reality show, The Ultimate Fighter. So this was, this was the last hurrah. 
literally for the sport. My first impressions of Forrest was, this guy and me are gonna get along. First day, there's tension between me and Stefan. He was easy going, so was I. And even when we talked, we, we just clicked good chemistry. I had a spar the first day, immediately sizing him up as the competition. Because he's about my size, I knew that he's the guy. Yeah, the first sparring session was fine. I thought everything was going good. I go at him, and I try to knee him to the body some, and I pull his head into my head. And no head gear on, of course. Crack, boom, cut, holy crap. I'm still going after him, hitting him as he's like trying to hold his head. I didn't think he was being too wild or too unruly, but the coaches did. and. I'm like, okay, I'll let him think Forrest is an asshole, sure. I can't believe this. Go get sewed up, holy crap. Uh, he's got a good one. That might be it, I might be off the show. You know, we had an outline and layout for how the show would work. But every day that we showed up was something new. We, re we really didn't know what was gonna happen or how it was gonna go down. Here's a toast. Yeah. You the best of luck to everybody. You hear something good come of it yeah. from everyone, yeah. regardless who wins yeah. it all. I didn't take a leak on his bed, I spritz. Oh, there you go, let's rub it in. There's a difference. I took alcohol away from everybody, I took the liquor out of the house. We're like, that was a bad idea. Dana decided to remove the alcohol from the house. I haven't done anything bad this whole time, man. I gotta do something rebellious. You know what? I'm gonna make a booze run. Stefan Bonner pretends he's taking a shower. I turn the water on, I shimmy out that little window, and I'm like, get one arm out, and I plop out into the bushes. I get up and I freaking take off. This house is in the middle of fucking nowhere. It's in the desert. And this guy goes to a liquor store. He gets a Mad Dog 2020, a case of beer, and I run back to the house. I see the trucks with the spotlights, obviously looking for me. So I'm Rambo style, crawling through the grass with the beer and liquor. Ducking when the trucks come by, playing dead. I shimmy back in through the window, slam a little man dog, and I walk out with the towel on, and everyone's there, the coaches, everyone, producers, and they tried to walk off as nothing happened. Stefan, get back here, and throwing you off the show, this is it, please, here's the mad dog bag. And then a couple hours later, okay, we'll give you one more shot. 10 times out of 10, I kicked that guy out of the house. I don't know why, and I don't know for what reason I did not kick Stefan Bonner out. I left him in and I let him stay. We had grown through the season. The numbers went like this all season. We don't know what's gonna happen, but what we do know is that we need to have a killer finale. Millions of people watch this fight. Far more than any UFC pay-per-view ever. Far more than any mixed martial arts pay-per-view all over the world. This is, a, this is a huge event for mixed martial arts in America and the UFC in general. The finale was our first live fight on free TV. What I was telling myself is there's gonna be a million people watching. I got the jitters, I got nervous. Me and my coach, Chuck Liddell, we drank a whole bottle of Pepto-Bismol between the two of us. Before you fight, you wanna get all your excrement out of you, you know, really important. So I went in there, you know, getting it out, and I was something I don't do too much, pray. In the middle of that prayer, connecting with God, Wham, 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 wham. Fighters out of shit. Like, really? Go fucking fuck off. 
right after the shitter with God, I am really calm and centered, you know? And here's Dana. Comes and wishes me good luck and looks at me and I could see it like he is nervous. His voice kind of a little shaky and this dude's more nervous than me. We're going into the co-main event. Kenny Florian versus Diego Sanchez. Diego Sanchez goes in and just rips right through Kenny Florian like Kenny Florian didn't even belong there. Diego Nightmare Sanchez! And I was just like, oh man, that wasn't even a fight. That wasn't even a fight. You know, so I'm, I'm sweating everything. I'm, you know, Forrest Griffin and Stefan Bonner get in there and they just start going at it. These guys are swinging. Everything's good. Somehow I end up taking him down, taking us back. I go for some nonsense, bogus submission. Like he went for the arm bar, and I cleared the arm, finished the round. He's on his back, laying there like this. I made a huge mistake. When the round ended, he got up and walked back to his corner. I laid on the mat, and then I get back to my corner. Ding, ding, ding. You got to go back out. I'm like, what the fuck? What the fuck? Oh my God, I'm so exhausted. How did I get so tired in five minutes? Now you have to remember, this is before social media. So what I believe is happening is people are at home and they're watching this fight and they're picking up the phone and they're calling their friends going, you gotta put this fight on on, on Spike TV. Dude, turn on Spike. I don't know what the fuck this is, but this fight is fucking great. I still felt good and I knew I was fresh and my game plan's work and everything's going according to plan. I've won the first round, I think I'm doing pretty good. He comes out and just starts walking through me. The second round, unbelievable. Knock down, drag him out, crazy fight. The crowd in here is just on its feet. Place is going crazy. Oh my goodness! Now at the time, what's happening on television is during the second round of that fight, the numbers got so high that it actually outrated the Masters. This Stephen is one of the greatest moments in UFC history. And now it hits me. Round two ends, and I am completely gassed. What made that fight so great is both of those guys wanted what was at stake just as bad as the other one did. They both wanted that contract. They saw that winning this finale was really gonna mean something. Here we go. Round three, honestly, was a sloppy, exhausted blur. These two guys are beating the ever-living fuck out of each other right now, and you could hear the rating tick, 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 up in your brain. The round ended and it was like, thank God this is over. Sounds like a train's going through this place. The winner, by unanimous decision, Forrest Griffin! 
Oh my God. <laughs> that is what it's all about right there. Congratulations, we present you with the UFC Light Heavyweight Trophy. You are the ultimate fighter. I mean, that was one of the happiest moments of my life, you know? It was an insane, insane moment. The whole night just, you know, it's like a whirlwind, man. It's pretty cool. Despite beating the absolute crap out of each other and me losing the absolute heartbreaker, I was genuinely happy for him. One more second here. Frank, Lorenzo, and I have gotten together and we've decided there is no loser in this fight. And we're gonna offer Stefan Bonner a six-figure contract with the UFC. I was totally cool not getting by the way. In my head, I was going back to what I was gonna do with my life. I had already gotten over it. By the time Dana's goes, and we're giving stuff in honor. It's like, in my head, I go, oh shit, like, what did I get myself into? When we come out of the octagon, the Spike TV guys pull us out into an alley. It's by the dumpsters, midnight, Vegas. It's me, Frank, Lorenzo, and Craig Poligian, and the executives from Spike, and we literally start hammering out a real television deal written on a napkin. These guys at Spike had never seen anything like that on their air. They knew the next morning, if they didn't get the deal done, they were going to be fucked because those ratings were gonna go through the fucking roof. They knew they had lightning in a bottle. That fight solidified it. It was a good deal for Spike, great deal for Ultimate Fighter, and you know that was our second season. The deal that we cut with Spike, we ended up owning everything. We owned 100% of everything. It's both thing, Dana and the Fertitas for Dana. Thanks for the opportunity, brother. It felt like a sense of relief, like we could finally actually make a toast, you know, to a little bit of success. Wow, this is actually gonna work after everything we've been through over these last five or six years. We bought the company in 2001 for $2 million. We were 40-something million dollars in the hole when we funded The Ultimate Fighter. Fast forward to 2016, we sell the UFC for $4.025 billion. I was one of the sparks that made this happen along with Forrest. My little contribution to the UFC or to the canon of fight history in general, uh, it's extremely important to me. It's the fulfillment of a dream, really. Craziness. To me, the most interesting thing about the whole story is all the little things that fell in line for this to happen. I almost didn't get on the plane. Stefan almost got kicked off the show by Dana, you know? It was really a lot of little things happened. There couldn't have been two more perfect guys for this. You had nobody special, average Joe one, versus nobody special, average Joe two. Not only athletically, weren't we like totally gifted, crazy athletes, right? Ego-wise, we weren't projecting these huge egos and identities, which just like made everyone be able to project themselves into us that night. And that made the sport our sport. They both rose to the occasion that night and were a part of something bigger than they ever could have dreamed. It was literally the future of an entire sport.